So hello, Carla and Lennon, and welcome to The Collective Reset, my new podcast. Excited to have you guys. Um, oh, hey. Hey, hey, hey. Why don't you introduce yourselves? You can start with Lennon first. Just give your name, although I just said it, and then where you are in the world. Um, hi, I'm Lennon Flowers. I'm here in Los Angeles. And I'm Carla Fernandez, and I'm dialing in from Oakland, California, just a block away from Lake Merritt, for folks that know the zone. And how do I know you guys? What's our relationship? Oh, good question. <laughs> um, so I'm the co-founder and ED of The Dinner Party, um, and I believe that our first meeting, in fact, I don't believe it, I know, um, that our first meeting was while, was via a phone call while you were sitting in a P.F. Chang's in Miami as our very first host in Miami when we were a baby nonprofit um, just beginning to talk about grief and connect folks to one another. So that would have been um, probably since 2014. And then you've been on staff since, are we here? Three-year anniversary, two-year anniversary. What is time? I think, yeah. I so I think 2014. I was sitting in PF Chang's, which everyone who knows me <laughs> knows is one of my favorite places. <laughs> and I was reading O Magazine, and they had done a spread on you guys. And I was sitting there. And I just moved to this new city and had lost my parents and ended a relationship and was like, "What the fuck am I doing?" And I sent an email and I think Lennon responded within like a half, I was still there. So within like a very short amount of time. And Which has talked- never happened before or <laughs> since, by the way. <laughs> Literally within like 20 minutes. For our response rate. <laughs> it was an amazing response rate. And we got on the phone and yeah, I was a host, I think within that month. And we'll explain a little later, like what that even means. Um, and then... Started working three years ago as staff. Coming up on the anniversary. Oh, happy anniversary, babe. Oh, thank you. (laughs) So, Carla, I know you are in Oakland, and you also were in Joshua Tree for a while. And one of the reasons why I love this podcast is, like, having all these people in these different locations and people getting to really hear what it's like in those cities um, and how those cities are responding so you having gone between the two, like, let's talk about what yeah. were racial temperatures like? What, is, what did it feel like in Joshua Tree? What is it like in Oakland? Yeah. So it was interesting to be, we were in Joshua Tree the week that the protests were happening to the most vividly. And it was super surreal to be sitting down our dirt road in a rural place, primarily white place, watching protests happening in Oakland, watching YouTube videos of folks hot wiring cars and driving them through the glass window of car dealerships and feeling both like a, oh my God, is this real life? And a surrealness around that being less than a mile from our apartment here in Oakland and an excitement around like, finally, you know, people taking to the streets and, um, And then the next morning we left the house and there was two people on the corner in Joshua Tree with with signs up about Black Lives Matter and like a very, very hyper local, tiny protest. So to me, it was powerful to see both extremes, you know, to be in a place that has been the, you know, the seat or the headquarters for the Black Power movement for so long or always perhaps. Um, and to be able to watch the scale of protests that were happening here, but then to also see the the super small town version um, and the Joshua Tree version being like almost in some ways just as moving, you know, there were days where there was a person on the corner to sign up and like felt really good to lean on my horn as I was driving by and show support in that way. And then Lennon, you're in LA, which is always been known for having a passion behind their protests. Um, And I know I've seen on Instagram that you attended a protest. Like, what is that like in such a large city, such a diverse city? What has that felt like to be there? 
Yeah, it's been wild. So I actually oftentimes um, find it dis- not dissimilarly from Carlos, split my time um, between LA and an incredibly rural community um, in Colorado. My partner works for the public health department in a little town called Creed, population 400 in Southwest Colorado. And it was interesting. So I was driving, we had been out there um, for a month and I was driving back, um, I guess, left Creed on a Saturday as protests were starting in the valley there in response to or urging um, for the opening up of business of small businesses. Um, and this was like the like terrifying, you know, like all white militia, self-appointed militiamen um, standing in front of businesses in protest of um, my partner's work in the public health department and anybody who was um, rightfully concerned about um, safety and in the midst of an outbreak um, of COVID among farm workers there, um, an emerging outbreak. And it was wild to drive into the city um, because it was uh, at the same time as George Floyd's death. And so suddenly I got back to LA and, you know, those first few days, it was the constant, you know, 24 hour a day sound of helicopters. This was the moment in which um, LA had called in the National Guard. Um, and it was a very evident, like a real feeling of, um, you know, danger and anxiety as well as possibility, right? Um, but it was a moment in which, you know, um, the police very much had control um, and power and were amassing power. Um, and I was down, um, I guess that Sunday, went down to a protest in Long Beach um, and it was beautiful. Um, it began in the afternoon, um, you know, and just repeatedly, um, you know, to uh, be sitting in a large crowd, everyone was masked, everyone was like deeply respectful um, of one another, um, kneeling, um, chanting, you know, um, and moments of prayer in whatever form that took for you, right? Um, And then it was interesting as the march began, um, we had to drive back around like five o'clock for the uh, curfew, it was those days. Um, and we could see the National Guard unit coming in, um, like from a block away, like parallel. And within 45 minutes of leaving, um, a journalist was hit by a rubber bullet um, from the intersection where we've been standing. And I think that that, like, part of the story that, like, um, you know, so much of the violence within this city, um, you know, was the product of a police escalation, right? Um, and a real fear, um, you know, like, and the fear that that induced. Um, and was oftentimes not part of, obviously, like the narrative that was told, you know, in those moments. And then it's been an extraordinary thing to see the complete shift in power, right? Um, And from something, um, you know, that uh, had a real, you know, I think that there was a real responsibility um, if you were, you know, in a um, in a healthy body, right? Um, and one that was not at profound risk, you know, of COVID in this moment, I think for white bodied folks to be out there um, felt so important um, at that time. And then to see like the city shift and it was, um, you know, suddenly like actually the demands um, of Black Lives Matter, which has been, um, you know, in the works, right? And so much organizing over the course of years, right? Um, to get to this point where we could have um, like very clear asks, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, I don't trust, you know, Garcetti uh, is not on my like top list of trusted humans. And yet, um, you know, the mayor of LA has a real interest in supporting the protesters and this movement, right? And responding in real ways to um, what actually does defund the police in this city look like? Um, when we're cutting 100 or $200 million um, from their budget for next year, you know, and what does progress actually look like? So it has been to see this kind of sea change um, from one of profound intimidation um, to one of um, power and possibility has been an amazing thing to behold. And then, um, you know, just last weekend, we're down at uh, one of the, at a vigil um, for Father's Day and just, you know, this like, beautiful gathering um, in a spot in a park, um, you know, where a man uh, just two years ago, and an unarmed man was killed. Um, And his parents, his mother and his father both spoke. um, And it was just, you know, the spiritual possibility in this moment, you know, um, has been so profound to behold. Um, So what a time to be alive. (laughs) It is. I think, you know, it's really why this 
podcast was born and why the idea behind it was born was this like it really is becoming a reset for a lot of us for all of us um we've been asked to really like sit down and and figure out who we are in this moment and who we want to be after this moment um and how we want to be remembered in this time and I think it's interesting because so we see each other throughout the week on our like work calls, right? Which is why we didn't have the big like, oh, because I've already <laughs> seen you like yesterday. But we were in person March 6th, right? For our uh, staff retreat in Joshua Tree. We were in person right before that at Esalen for our retreat. And that was like January 30th. And like how different the conversation has become since then and how much I feel like we've all changed internally since then. And so I'm wondering, like, when you look back at those times, right? And so that was a couple months ago. Like, what are you feeling like, wow, there has been a big shift in this for me since the last time that we sat with each other? Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> just the, like, you know, what a, I don't know, I, I, like, it has been such a, like, humbling experience in our staff retreat. Um, we made a rule, like, we're not going to talk about coronavirus, because that is a distraction. Um, and <laughs> we are here to talk about serious things and serious plans for the next year ahead. Can we please keep that out of the circle? We'll come back to you Monday. And then, like, the next week was, like, shelter in place. Okay, yeah. here we go. Here's a new normal and reality. And, like, um, and let alone the kind of, like, beautiful um, but profoundly privileged circumstances of Esalen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and is sitting with kind of questions of, um, you know, like how do we interrogate, right? Um, you know, our how we have arrived um, as individuals, um, as you know, collectives in this moment, you know, and like what is um, the you know like grief that was held and necessarily so, you know, within a grief retreat in Esalen. Um, around, you know, largely individual experiences, right? And then the translation process of like what we are seeing now is an outpouring of grief that has taken to the streets, right? Um, and is insisting upon a world in which Black lives are valued um, and Black deaths um, are prevented, right? Um, and like, so I feel like there's just been such a, um, you know, not for the first time, but like um, just a, a like reset around like the things that you thought were important, right? The things that you put into your plans, right? Mm -hmm. um, like actually it's not to say that like none of that mattered before this moment, um, but like we're, you know, like I feel like so much of our work in like grief, right? Is about, um, you know, and then life happens to you um, and it forces you, um, you know, to respond meaningfully and not, you know, like so much of our like mourning process is so often around, you know, like, oh, my life, but for, right. And I wish that things could go back and there is no going back and there is no like previous normal. And so I think that adjustment process into new normal and what does this moment require of me, of us, you know, um, has been like just a really, um, yeah, it's such a meaningful a meaningful question to ask personally and such an extraordinary experience to, um, you know, like really reckon with that as a collective. Absolutely. Carla. Would, yes. Well, um, you my dear. I was just, I had to look back on my calendar to think when our team retreat was. And I was like, that was in March. That was in 2020. It feels like <laughs> six years ago. And I'm like, Oh, totally cringing at the like, joke corona as we were drinking that weekend and like get <laughs> up a little like er, er, you know um so that feels very humbling to think about how quickly things can change yeah. um and we were part of one of the other anecdotes that came up at our excellent experience was um, one of our attendees is immunocompromised and asked us to confirm whether or not anyone on premises who had been through Wuhan China and I remember a moment being like, oh God, I have, I don't even know how I would get that information. That seems a little extreme, don't you think? Um, and ended up someone on the facility had been to China and there had been enough of the time in between where they had been quarantining and it was fine. 
holding that story, which I had a little bit of resistance towards one month, six weeks into the future, I had like such a deeper sensitivity and appreciation for like, no, that wasn't being high maintenance. That was like life or death. And Mm -hmm. Yeah, and like how him. quick we are to dismiss each other's stories, you know, mm-hmm. and um, yours. Exactly. Um, and Lennon and I, that week after we were at Esalen and had like a real bender, we had a kind of a manic week of fundraising. And that meant we were on like, you know, five airplanes in seven days kind of a thing. And um, I've reflected a lot on that moment as being both a lot of things. A, had both of us also had a cold cold that week, which we've since... I remember had. that. Yeah. yeah. We we're like not well. Um, mm-hmm. So it brings up all these questions of like a culture that we live in that is just like push yourself as hard as you can go. It's like all for a good cause, but it's like really about for as much as we do talk about kindness and compassion and ease, we often run as fast as we can, as long as we can, as hard as we can. Um, and reflecting back on that week of a potentially spewing our cold germs across seven different transcontinental flights. Um, and the, like, you know, the butterfly effect of a moment like that. And, Mm -hmm. and then feeling as things started to get canceled, a real, for me, a sense of relief of like, wow, we actually already had 2020 kind of figured out and we were going to be sprinting and, it was interesting that so many different events and programs and opportunities that we put time into creating and cultivating suddenly evaporated as everyone else's plans did. I was surprised to find like a relief in that of like, Oh, this is maybe the first time in human history since probably the industrial revolution that we're actually being forced to like slow the heck down. Mm -hmm. And I don't think any of us would have cultivated that for ourselves. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So thinking a lot about like the speed with which we move and the amount that we take on and how do we live in a way that's more in line with nature, more compassionate to ourselves and the people around us. And um, I think a lot of the reset for me personally, has been in that territory. Mm-hmm. I think when we like, when we think about how quickly things can change and the reset that we, especially us three, have already had to go through, right? Um, I yeah. love if we can start to talk about grief and just how TDP came apart, came about. Um, so maybe Lennon, if you want to start us off with just what your story was and and how you came to Carla, and then Carla can fill us in as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never quite thought of it in those terms, but like life is one big collection of resets, you know, Um, and and I guess that began, um, you know, for me, um, my mom was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer when I was 17 um, and a senior in high school. Um, And suddenly that like, you know, shifted from I grew up in North Carolina and it was, um, you know, I was hell bent on getting as far out of the state as quickly as I could, you know, and going into like, I was a theater kid and, you know, like, okay, like bright lights, here we come, you know, Um, and I was like, nope, um, we're going to be close to home um, and needing to stay, you know, um, within a kind of short drive, um, you know, uh, needed uh, public school and, uh, because, you know, the cost of cancer is expensive, right. And all of these things, right. Um, were suddenly a turning point and, and realizing like, you know, in retrospect, I didn't want that, you know, um, and, um, and the ability, um, you know, I think it was, it was also like, what does life require of you and require of you now? And it was a, you know, like what could have um, seemed a difficult decision wasn't, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, And my mom died my senior year of college. Um, And, you know, throughout all of that time, I had just gotten extremely gifted um, in compartmentalization, you know, and never talking about, um, it wasn't, you know, avoiding that which was real, you know, I was like really involved in a lot of student organizing, but it was staying as busy as possible to avoid um, the complexity of, a, you know, what had always been a complex home life, you know, um, and trying to kind of keep, um, you know, the doors, um, you know, guarded, 
um, from like, oh, I'm, I don't want to let you into the mess of my life because I don't want to scare you away. Um, you know, from like friendship and everything else that feels good, right? And I don't want to simply be, you know, like that kind of, um, somebody was describing it yesterday of like the feeling of like you become the car crash, right? And everybody's like head is bent around you and like, oh, but please like don't infect me with your sad and hard, right? Like I gotta I like stay a that. little bit like far apart. Isn't that so good? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, no, just uh -huh. become the car crash, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, so then it was, you know, three years, um, after she had died that I moved out to LA, um, you know, with itchy feet in your twenties as when I was want to do. And I was, um, you know, following a musician boyfriend at the time, um, and moved on Saturday on Monday, my first day on the job, um, interviewed Carla, who was also, um, interviewing for the same company, had also just moved down for her musician boyfriend. Um, and Carla was like, can we be friends and trade numbers? And I was like, yes. <laughs> so we've, I guess, like, always been really good at violating professional boundaries um, from day one of our friendship. Um, and so, yeah, I became friends. Um, and it was through, you know, months into that um, that she mentioned um, that her father had passed away six months before, um, you know, and that wasn't, it wasn't, it's not to say that it was the first conversation that I'd ever had of like, oh, you too, right? Um, but it was the first time that I remember actually wanting to have the conversation, right? Not just to like close it with, you know, a sentence, yes, my mom died on this date, um, you know, a, an ever-changing number, you know, of how long ago it was and close like on to the next, you know? Um, but there was some suddenly like a deeper longing for me to talk about who my mom was as a living person um, and like, and how her life um, had in, continued to inform mine um, and how, you know, her death and absence had changed everything, right? Um, and in ways that, you know, like didn't have an end date. Um, so Carla invited me over for dinner one night. Um, and I said, with all the trepidation in the world, yeah, okay. <laughs> and Carla? Yeah. So how did you find Lennon? I was so relieved that at this dream job, I was in like my final round interview and they had the, like the new girl come and sit with me for an hour and chat. And I'll never forget, we bonded over our musician boyfriends who we not long after broke up with or got broken up with by, I can't remember which one, <laughs> all blur. Um, We're going to tell the story as you broke up with them. You dump their asses. Reclamation of our narratives, okay? <laughs> Later losers, and no, they're not losers. They're both wonderful. Um, and Will and I ended up actually moving in together, which is like always a, yeah, we have always been friends first in the work that we do. Um, now wives, we say, not actually married, but definitely married. Um, yeah. And I remember in the conversation that Lennon and I had the first time she was asking me like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Um, and it, which is like the most charming interview question ever. And I remember saying something about, I don't know, I could imagine starting my own social enterprise. I don't know what it would be. And there was like another moment of me too that we have there um, of like, yeah, would be cool um, to start something, build some sort of organization or movement followed a few months later by the me too of we had both lost a parent um and I think when we started doing the dinners there was no intention of like at that point a conscious intention of that being the organization this was like some weird dead parents club thing we were doing on the side um but I think as fate would have it that was actually the what the idea that wanted to exist in the world and I always, I more and more, I think about it as if like the idea chose us and we're just trying mm. to put the tracks down as fast as we can in front of it. Um, mm. And I think for, for me and my grief experience, my dad died New Year's Day, 2010. Um, his name was Jose. And I had lived with him for the six months prior as he was battling brain cancer and was, I think did a lot of like the anticipatory grieving that I now know was a thing at the time no one around me could really explain what I was feeling. Um, and through supporting him as he was dying and then the months after his loss, looked around and realized that all of the books that were being offered to me 
limited though they were and the conversations I was having really weren't satisfying and it was a real like Goldilocks moment of going to therapy and my therapist is a badass but it was still a monologue and it was like hundreds of dollars a session and I went to the traditional grief support group and that was fine and works for some people but was like a metal a circle of metal folding chairs and most of the people in the room were 50 or 60 grieving their parents and I felt like even more isolated in those spaces. Um, and I'd also found in my talk about reset, I, I found in my dad's dying process, like a real, I was sitting with some really big spiritual questions for the first time in my life that frankly, I'm still sitting with today of like, oh my gosh, I now know that life is temporary, not in an intellectual way, but in a visceral way. Like I've seen it come and go what does that mean for how I want to live? What does that mean for the relationships I want to keep? What does that mean for the shifting dynamics within my family? And I found that a lot of the spaces that were sort of grief spaces were just fucking really sad all the time. And there was this one note of like, let's just get you back to normal. Um, But for me, there was no more normal. And actually I wanted to dive deeper into these questions of like, what the hell is going on here? And how do I learn from this? I remember thinking of it like I'd seen this, like the best movie I'd ever seen in my life, like a really good movie, but a really sad one, intense, all of the feelings. And I didn't have anyone around me that I could like sit down with and talk to about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was in meeting Lennon for the first time that I like found an opening of someone who was my age, who wasn't like my parents' age, looking at me with pity eyes that I was a 21 year old without a father and Um, yeah, it was around that first table that we created that night back in 2010 in LA where I was like, oh, here are the people that I can actually like start unpacking this stuff with and not feel like I'm being victimized or felt bad for, or, um, you know, no one's scribbling notes in a notebook about like what pills to give me after all of this. Yeah. And so you guys created and founded this amazing nonprofit called the dinner party. And so what's a dinner table when you're saying like, for the people who have no idea, when you're saying there's a table, like, what does that mean? And what's happening there? Yeah, I mean, so, and it's actually interesting, but I think like, in a lot of ways, so I mean, so much of our work has evolved, you know, like, um, light years, you know, in the last 10 years since that first dinner. Um, And yet what a dinner party and dinner table is, um, you know, actually, resembles in a lot of ways, you know, that early experience. Um, And so a dinner party table um, is a group of peers um, that um, we have historically matched people to through like the like human algorithm um, of like, oh, you know, looking for people with both shared loss experiences, right? Um, And, you know, um, sources of commonality in their stories, right? And oftentimes among people that are like, wait, I I thought that I was the only one, right? So a dinner party, you know, remains very much what that early group was right which is a group of friends um and you know people who aren't just sitting down one time though it can be really powerful you know when you sit down for the first time and you share something that you've never heard yourself say out loud right that felt entirely too scary or untouchable either to you or to every other person in your world and instead of seeing that kind of like moment of revulsion you know and fear and pity face in somebody else's eyes you see a head nod, right? You see affirmation, you see validation, you see like, oh, I'm not alone, right? And the power of the words, me too. Um, but it can, you know, I think we're, we've are we always been more interested um, not in like dinner one, right? But in, you know, conversation seven and eight and how do you grow up as a group of friends for whom nothing is on, off the table, right? And as like Carla named, you know, that there's this, you know, like a part of the turning point in the reset in, you know, folks' lives is that, um, you know, you are made infinitely stronger than you thought you were, right? Um, And some of the, you know, like most, you know, purpose-seeking people with like the lowest, you know, tolerance for bullshit that I know um, tend to be, you know, members of this club. Um, And so our work is around how do we help people find each other, 
right? Um, and people who, you know, are sharing other milestones in their lives and other, um, you know, sources of commonality so that we can just make better friends and cut through the kind of like veil of nonsense, um, you know, that separates us from one another and that keeps us in these kind of superficial um, you know, heady conversations without ever actually getting to like see each other in deeply. Mm -hmm. What I think is interesting, what you said is, yeah, the big question has been, okay, so how are we bringing people together? Right. And prior to COVID and the civil rights movement, we were bringing people together in person and we have tables all over the world. Um, and there's usually a host, right, that helps to facilitate and then like 10 to 12 people maybe that sit at the table and it's usually the same group. But now we've had to shift. So I'm wondering like, well, I'm not wondering because I work for the org, but for the, <laughs> or for the people who are watching is if you want to explain just how we've responded to people not being able to gather in person um, and how what we've, what we've decided as an org to do to bring people together yeah so you know like I think um work in you know grief okay we've got some job security in this moment um but like the things that you know we're not doing is having dinner it turns out like eating meals on zoom is pretty gross um and, <laughs> um, and getting together you know in person and so what does that look like um, and so we've been able to shift into launching virtual tables, um, you know, and part of one of the things that's, you know, been interesting is to see that, like, actually our capacity and willingness to get real with one another, you know, in a virtual setting, um, you know, I always, I frankly, like, kind of approach this with some, no, with no small measure of skepticism, you know, and not knowing um, if you could cultivate the same kind of honesty, right, and openness and intimacy and warmth um, that I know you can do around a table when you like put a drink in somebody's hand, you know, and just welcome them into a space, right? Um, and so it's been really amazing um, to see that like that actually is very true. And in this moment in which, you know, like people are so longing for connection, right? Um, yeah, so we've been able to launch virtual tables. And I think that um, it's been amazing to see the responsiveness um, you know, one of the things that we've had to shift and massively is, you know, from this point, you know, to this point, we've had a really relational one to one kind of approach, right, um, where we, you know, like it used to be that, you know, somebody on our staff, often you, <laughs> would get on the phone with every single host, you know, and have both a chance to hear, you know, like how comfort comfortable they are in talking about their own loss experience, right? What is it that brings them here? What are they looking to do? Um, and to, you know, grow into, and is this, you know, somebody that like, has like a natural, you know, proclivity to hosting in their own lives, right, to like being that person who can make other people feel comfortable, and then introducing them to like all of the how to's. Well, very quickly, you know, when you have, you know, 100,000 people die within the span of three months, right, the recognition and realization of like, um, there is such profound longing, for connection and there's such profound need to be able to talk about you know the thing that we have all you know one of many elephants that we have let run rampant in the room you know like and now we've got like the twins of grief and race and racism you know in this country and all of the things that which to which we have attached silence so often right and now they are um you know in some ways very viscerally um bleeding out right um and begging um, to be seen, named, witnessed, um, and, and heard, you know, um, and so we've been able to shift into training, you know, dozens of hosts, um, in a batch, you know, and bringing on, um, I think now we've got close to 50 virtual tables, um, that we've been able to bring aboard, um, within the last, uh, just over a month, um, and, you know, uh, and then matching people one-to-one, -one, you know, like when what you're looking for isn't necessarily, you know, because you've got a lot going on in your life and it could be that there are, you know, kids at home or caretaking responsibilities and all of the things that get in the way of like, I don't know if I can hang out, you know, once a month, but I'd love to actually connect with another human being who knows what this is like, you know, um, and with whom I don't have to like closet myself, you know, so we've been able to match people to their grief buddy you know, um, and it's been just really um, amazing to see the responsiveness, you know, in an age in which, um, you know, the 
the popular narrative is one of disconnection to see like the real possibilities of connection right now. And I would just add on top of that, Liana froze, you're back. Great, okay, you're there. Um, you know, one of the silver linings of this time, not to put any kind of bow around any of it has been kind of unleashing us from time and space, which have been the walls within which we've had to operate. So matching folks that apply to a table means we're not just looking at their personal story or their age or what they like to do on the weekend, but we're also looking at what zip code do they live in and are they within driving distance of a table, uh, which means that there are in areas where we have higher volume of partiers in say New York City, we can really match tables to one another based on certain affinities or experiences, but in places that are more rural or where we don't have as much interest, um, it's sort of like the first 12 people that apply in Anchorage, Alaska are all gonna get matched to each other. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this moment is that we're now able to create more affinity tables and spaces for people that share a certain identity whether it's LGBTQ plus or whether it's POC or folks who've lived through a certain type of loss that can be even more isolating, say loss to addiction or loss related to suicide um, and match those people to one another. Um, and we're, you know, Ayana, you can maybe even speak about the table that you've been running on Friday nights. Yeah. We're hearing from folks that sure there isn't maybe the same oxytocin as being across the table and like passing someone food and breaking bread literally um but being able to meet with people who really really get where you're coming from and who might be living across the country but know what you're talking about can be really powerful i think i've noticed two things in doing these virtual tables and one i think it's what is that when it comes to grief what we see often in our dinner tables are sometimes there can be lack of attendance, right? And lack of attendance is because that day it's just too much for you, right? Or, or the idea of having to get in your car when you're still grieving and you're, you've had a hard day and your kid's been crying and then you have to drive someplace to sit sometimes can be a lot. And it's like, this has really allowed people to just say, I need this and I'm signing on. Right. And I think it's eliminated that, that grief flu that we talk about of it, like mm. keeping you kind of paralyzed from moving forward. Um, and I also think like I was a little worried about the, the digital space, making it that people couldn't have authentic conversations. And I almost feel like it's done the opposite mm. of like, I think it allows you because you're sitting in your own safe space. So I think it allows people to tap a little deeper into their grief sometimes and not for everyone, but I think there are a lot of introverts that want to be heard in, in, in person spaces and sometimes don't have the bandwidth to, to go there. Um, sometimes don't have the bandwidth to go there and it can be really nice for them to be able to have their voice because they're sitting in a digital space. Um, on Fridays, so I do the POC group for TDP, so it's people of color, and we started that at our camp, right, and that was in September of last, of 2019. What was that? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, we're going to have to skip this year. Oh, feels um, like. We're going to skip this year, but we will come back to it the following, but we started a POC group there, and now we meet every Friday, and it's grown to be something that I just think it's amazing to watch these people come from all over the world. And you just get to hear such different perspectives, which is, mm -hmm. I think people are really enjoying right now to, you're disconnected, but you're still able to remain in a community, which especially for grief, I think is important. Totally. Yeah. Um, I don't think I had like ever fully sat with just the like sheer number of barriers that were like present, you know, and, and let's recognize too, that like, even now this depends on a steady Wi-Fi connection, you know, and a computer and some space, um, in your home where you can have like some measure of privacy and feel safe, right. That there's still a lot of issues of access, you know, um, that are inherent in this. Um, but I think, you know, for folks with disabilities, right. Um, you know, for whom, um, this is actually like the only point of access, right? And an easy one. 
um, you know, as you named, I think like so many of our spaces center extroverts, you know, um, and like, what does it look like to create an environment and, and to be more tolerant? I think in some ways we're more tolerant of like silences in virtual spaces because like, yeah, of course this is awkward. Of course it's weird, you know, and silence is such a gift and a tool, you know, for processing. And it might take somebody like an extra, you know, like beat and minute to like summon what it is that they want to say, you know, and what they're called into. And then the people that are, you know, like remote and we're never going to have access to a table, you know, um, it's, it's been really amazing to see like, oh, actually, um, this, this isn't just, you know, like a temporary way of responding to a temporary moment. Um, this is a reset on like where work is. Mm -hmm. We also have just started doing, um, for Mother's Day and Father's Day, Ayana, as you know, <laughs> as you know, um, basically like come one come all dinners virtually for mother's day last month father's day this month and that was another thing that we were kind of skeptical about is like what are these breakout rooms and will they work and um they've been really beautiful evenings like the father's day one that we just had a couple days ago we had over 150 people rcp and about 90 people showed up which might seem like a big drop off rate, but we were thrilled that almost 100 people decided to log in and had hosts of tables join us to kind of host the individual breakout rooms. And my favorite part of it was after having spent the entire day scrolling through my Instagram feed, seeing people hanging out with their dads and all of the other sort of jagged edges that can come with a day like Father's Day, even a decade after someone's died to sit in a Zoom and to click through four screens of many, many faces that were all sort of in it at the same time, feeling it in similar ways and very down to talk about it um, was really moving. And one of the women that was in my breakout group was saying that this was the first time that she's had anything to look forward to around Father's Day since her dad had died about nine years before. I I'm completely like, agree. I thought right? it was incredible. I thought that you know, how, when you lose your parents and you're working in this space, right? When you've lost someone and you're working in this space, it can be a lot. And so I did the Mother's Day and Father's Day events. And because they're both in the evening, I kind of went into it thinking that I was going to be like kind of dreading this thing all day. Mm -hmm. And then that I was going to sign on at night and be like, oh, I wish I was in bed right now or something. And it was the opposite. It really was like, oh, finally on Father's Day and Mother's Day, I have something coming. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, it was like if I had had a sad day of like the scrolling and like that, mm -hmm. I also was able to sit there and be like, oh, but look at all these other people who had such a yeah. terrible day. And we can all come together and support each other now. And it was phenomenal. Good events. And okay. that's the kind of thing that like we probably wouldn't have – had it been pre this time, we would have yeah. been like, we have to do it in person. And then mm -hmm. suddenly we would have been in like a four month long logistical nightmare of trying to host a dinner for a hundred people. Yeah. And like the simplicity with which we could set up a Zoom line. And it obviously took work to curate it, but it's suddenly allowing us to open these spaces with like, you know, less resources and that's more immediate. And yeah, I'm, I hope that we keep going with them. Yeah, me too. So in shifting gears a bit, we are all ladies and all living with our partners and quarantining with our partners. <laughs> and for me and John, it wasn't such a big shift. Like we had already downsized, moved into a bus, we're working remote. Um, so quarantining was like, hi, we've been doing this. But I would assume for you guys, it was a bit of a shift and Lennon's getting married coming up soon. Yeah. So I'm wondering what are two, like, well, you don't have to tell all their business, but two like quirky cons, two things that you have figured out about your partner. You're that you're like, wow, I had no fucking clue that this existed. <laughs> um, Lennon, you can go first. <laughs> I think it's, 
Or and maybe, you know what, let's shift it. Let's do one that you've learned about your partner and then one that you've learned about yourself. Yeah. And you're like, I did not know this about myself until I was forced to sit home. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, it's been interesting because like, I actually think, um, I feel like I've learned a lot more about me than I have. And, you know, like, I, Isaac is, <laughs> Isaac is filled with lots of quirks. <laughs> The ladies on this call know. Um, and um, and I, I was well familiar with them. Um, and I think that there are moments in which, like, um, I, you know, he is, he's a profound caretaker, um, you know, and like, and service driven. And I think in some ways, as somebody, what's interesting for me is like, I've basically been self-parenting since I was 21, you know, um, and beyond, you know, um, and like a hyper independent life, um, of which I'm like pretty proud. Right. Um, and so being sharing space with somebody, um, you know, who is, who a, you know, has come from like a loving family, <laughs> but it's still intact <laughs> and like, you know, all of the like unconditional associations of that is a really beautiful thing to behold. Um, but like, you know, the instinct of like offering and giving, right. And like my instinct is often, I'm fine. I don't need anything. Like I got this. Right. Um, and so it has been, so that has like, you know, forced conversation, um, you know, with the two of us in big ways. And when, you know, I, I think I've, you know, learned through this, um, and it wasn't our first encounter, but, um, you know, it was like realizing like when I pull away, his instinct is to go further in. Right. Um, and, you know, um, and so we really had to negotiate, you know, a lot of that. Um, and, and I think it was like a real unlearning, um, you know, for me of like, oh, I'm like pretty hard on this person can be pretty hard on this person, um, because I'm pretty hard on me, you know? Um, and, you know, I think like in the legacy of loss and inheritance, you know, like I came from a, you know, fierce as fuck mom who had to be, you know, um, but as a result, like, you know, uh, adapted and, and survived on the base, of, you know, like uh, on the basis of being on our own um, and having like a pretty strong instinct for criticism. And so, you know, for me, it's been like an unlearning and a softening of like, what is it, um, you know, like, what are all of the things that I like placed on him or like could easily like react to or eye roll at, you know, that like, actually, no, this is about me mm. um, and, and a letting go um, and like allowing, um, I think, learning to be cared for, you know, um, and all, allowing, you know, like, I think I've, you know, may have <laughs> like built my like, identity off of like eye rolls at the word self-care you know um and like eye rolls at slowing down and you know like this and the speed with which you know we've been um that for me like was a survival instinct and you know from the time I was 17 on um you know that in this moment as Carla's named as you've named that this is like requires a real slowing down um you know and an acceptance of like um, you know, just an exercise in daily compassion. Um, Isaac has become like a really big teacher to me and what that looks like. Um, and, you know, developing better practices and protocols and like, you know, living into that myself. Mm -hmm. Carla. Um, Ivan and I have totally named that this is like the COVID relationship accelerator experience. And, you know, I think we going into this time together, we both travel a lot for our work and just in our lives um, and had kind of this like fantasy of what would it ever be like if we actually slept in the same bed for 30 nights in a row or had, you know, dinner together multiple nights in a week. And suddenly we were like plopped right down dead center in the middle of that reality. Um, and it's been really sweet. You know, I think there's been, there was sort of the first month for both of us where we were nesting. It was like mandatory nesting um, that felt really good. I think the con or the trickiness or the tension for us has come up in the fact that I'm pretty extroverted. 
and he is more introverted. And so as we've started to like open back up and expand who our pod is, I've been learning a lot around like, how do I not just make decisions for myself being like the independent lady that I am, but actually needing to like include him in those conversations. Um, so yeah, so my instinct was like, we're going to Joshua tree and my whole family is going to come with us. Like get in the car, let's go. And, um, learning how to like, not just make that decision, but like have a conversation with my partner about that before I like send out the, send out the invitations to everybody. Um, so yeah, it's, it's like funny being kind of a chronic community builder connector and also needing to make sure that like I'm not making assumptions about who is welcome when and for how long and these kinds of things so and then he's a real alarm snoozer (laughs) yeah real alarm (laughs) snoozer we've really had to work on that this time Ivan's been training for a half marathon and has been when we were in the desert was waking up like 5 a.m to run before the sun came up because it's really hot there and there was a few mornings where that alarm would just keep ringing from 5 a.m until like 8 a.m and (laughs) some family meetings about that was not working for me that's hilarious my family meeting Uh well i think i think one of the things that's interesting that you both said is just the unlearning Mm -hmm. right and and i hope that that is what this audience gathers from the people that speak on here um, is just, and I, and I think we as grievers have almost become experts in this of like, okay, how much should we learn from that experience and have to unlearn about ourselves and the people we lost and our relationships to them in the world in order to figure out who we were. And now it's being asked to do the same thing, like unlearning things that we thought were right, right, in order to figure out our place in our relationships or the world or um and I just love that you both that that is the common thread for both of you is just softening and slowing down Mm -hmm. um, and unlearning and so thank you for sharing that with our people here of course yes and thank you for coming on and chatting Mm -hmm. um I really do love the dinner party and love the work we do and I hope that people are able to to find you guys and to if it's not for them then it's for someone they know because we all deal with loss um and so how can people find you specifically and then how can people find the organization so the org is the dinnerparty.org and on most social media Instagram at the dinner party um and let our emails our are our names at the dinner party.org so Carla with a c and Lennon as in the beetle <laughs> um yeah and we're both on all of the normal social media places as well I'm gonna learn to tweet again someday I, I swear it um <laughs> maybe, not. maybe we could just be done with that oh. yeah I don't do twitter it's too much yeah. it's just I can you know like and I think like what does it look like to be with your people you know in this moment like I think that we so often get sucked up you know like whether it's on planes and trains and automobiles and away from our people and just in the kind of like distracted rush it's been actually nice to like go a little be okay like going a little dark you know on the internet um in order to like really invest in us that said um find us on the internet internet. Yeah, Um, because this, I think it's easy to be in this time and just have our heads down and like totally miss the memo that this actually is a chance to like change behavior and have different kinds of conversations. So I'm so glad that you're reminding us this is a collective reset and an individual reset and global reset and everything in between. And how do we not miss the boat on it being that? Yeah, I think, you know, like, the unlearning that we do as white bodied folks, right? The unlearning that we do, um, you know, in any life of like learning to question the things that were handed you, you know, 
um, and to like deeply interrogate um, the assumptions, you know, that tell you to like live inside any box or any convention, um, you know, and that you have to do this thing because you should be doing this because there's no other way to do things. Well, like actually not true, a lie. Um, let's unlearn. So thank you for like bringing on the, us on this journey with you to use my favorite, least favorite word. Um, <laughs> this has been great. Of course. I love you guys. Thank you, my soul sisters. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your wisdom. And I will see you guys probably tomorrow or later today. But love you. Love Thanks. You. Bye. Big love. Bye.